Um, okay, today we're going to be talking about upgrading to Ruby 2.0 and, and beyond. Uh, my name is Joe Raffanello. You can uh, reach me online at Joe Raffani. Got the uh, username in college and it just stuck, so it's everywhere. I've been with Manage IQ since 2007. Some might contend, but I might be the 13th employee. I don't know. No. I'll let you know if that's, uh, you can decide if it's been good luck or not. Okay, so today we're going to talk about um, Ruby, Ruby 2.0 and beyond 2.1, um, reasons to upgrade, some of the legacy stuff we have to just clean up, and ultimately how do we build appliances and get developers right. So I was actually looking through the Git logs on our old repository and found that we started the 187 to Ruby 193 conversion back in November of 2011. And then we finally got there <laughs> April 23rd, 2013. 540 days later. Um, now, the lesson learned, we shouldn't have waited to upgrade. Um, some of the other things we found were some of the early patches and various changes we would make made upgrades very difficult. And that goes right into uh, Aaron's Rails presentation. Um, so this is just a very good indication that we should have started earlier. So why do we, why do we want to upgrade? Uh, 193 is ending. Um, it's actually in maintenance mode for a few more months, and then security only till 2015. Actually, maintenance mode, according to that, is over. It's, no, it's in maintenance until. That was that was passed. Yeah. That was passed. That's a okay, that's yeah, it's right. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Mode. Yes, so we're only in security <laughs> mode. Very good. You you get a Martin's award, right? Permission. Um, Ruby 2.0 is almost two years old, and 2.1 is almost a year old. And we're due to have Ruby 2.2 at Christmas, so we have to get moving. Some of the things in Ruby 2.1, which I'll start talking about because that's really the ultimate goal, are the generational marketing sweep garbage collector for applications that are not always great with um, memory allocations, doing to creating too many intermediate objects when we don't need to, um, this will just be a boom. Um, Ruby 2.1 will allow us to not have some of the pains that we had previously. Um, let's see, string freeze will now act, um, cause objects. Um, so string freeze allows us to reuse existing strings. So in the past, when we were at Rails, we were at Rails 3217, you could have the string Rails 3217 hundreds of times in your uh, process space. And so you, libraries and frameworks such as Rails are able to use this to reuse the existing string. Some of the other things in Ruby 2.0 are the allocation tracing. That allows us to get pinpoint accuracy as to where objects were created what line number in a file, and I have some examples later on. Additionally, I'll be speaking about keyword arguments that are introduced in Ruby 2.0, but there's an, another uh, required keyword arguments, and that was added in 2.1. Another useful one is uh, if you're doing meta programming in Ruby, uh, def now returns the name of the method, so you could use that as, as a result in defining new methods. That's as a symbol? Is this a self? As a symbol, yes. Uh, one of the other nice things is, uh, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with uh, active record statement invalid. That, that's kind of a generic error that you get when you possibly have a database error such as the database is down. Or if maybe a query fails, you don't have a table, you didn't migrate or anything like that. And so it's a ger generic exception, and you don't know what actually happened uh, unless you log it. So the exception cause here in Ruby 2.1 will allow you actually to get the original exception. 
if it was caught and then re-raised as a different exception. And there's much more in the two one. I don't have too many examples here because we have to get to uh, two up first. Now we can't talk about new rubies without talking about some useless benchmarks. Uh, so I just ran one of our tests that test suites that do um, the work for taking the data that we would get from various providers such as VMware, Rev, OpenStack, and simulate putting it into the database using BCR, one of the Ruby gems. So in Ruby 193, kernel over at, takes a minute 15. Then with Ruby 2.0, it's down to under a minute. Now this is mainly, um, a lot of this might be due to one of the things I'll be talking about, which is the speed of requiring files in Ruby 2.0. But here, now we see Ruby 2.13, we're down to 42 seconds. So it's the same exact code with no other alter alterations. It's almost twice as fast. Again, this is not a real benchmark, but it's on the lot. So here's an example of some allocation information. I was doing some um, checks of our existing test suite to see why we have some really slow tests. And so some of the things you can get are exact line numbers where 223,000 arrays were created. Here, when I was running this specific test. And we also have that information for strings. And so you could do that across the board wherever. And I haven't actually run it on a live system to see how much impact it has on performance, but I heard it's not horrible to actually run it on a system that you actually are doing a little bit of load on. And there are related issues that here that you can look in the ManageIQ repository. So that's really the goal, 2.1, because it's so much better performance. Uh, but first we've got to get to 2.0. So now let's talk about some of the features in Ruby 2.0. So I already spoke a little bit about the Rails startup, but this is really beyond just Rails startup. It's anytime you require files. So some of our models like host, VM, and VM, some of the god, uh, god objects, when they get required, they require the world. So they take a long time to start up and require all those files. As an example for faster Rails startup, you can see on 193, it's over four seconds, and on 2.0, it's a second faster. So you should see this, it's 25% faster. You should see it when you're running your tests. You will not want to go back to Ruby 193 to run your tests anymore. I can tell you, because I've been doing this for a while. And uh, you just, you're like, what is it doing? Uh, loading Rails console, but also when our workers start up, many times we have several workers starting, and they're all trying to require files at the same time. So this should also be beneficial there. Okay. The next feature, keyword arguments. It sim simplifies some of the uh, boilerplate conventions you would do for um, passing an options hash into a method and then accessing the values in it. And it also has some stuff for like setting default hash values and that, that type of thing. It is optional as it can handle all cases. So we'll, we'll see an example. So here in this EMS uh, VMware model, we have a method that's passing in an options hash, and it's setting some default values, merging them back into the op options hash, and passing them along to a new method, another method called, and retrieving the values back out of the options. So we have all this duplication here with the options. So you can see with keyword arguments, it becomes this. We define defaults here. And we can directly call on startup and user event, and it'll automatically pull them out of the hash based upon these values. The one nice thing is that it doesn't, it only changes the definition of your methods, not how you invoke them. So you can see these are all valid ways you can invoke that prior method on both Ruby 193 and 2 So it doesn't actually break the other side. So there are some shortcomings with this. Um, for one thing, you can use if as a hash, hash key. I don't know if you want to, but other keywords like if 
you, you, you wouldn't be able to use it as a keyword argument. Um, and as I mentioned before, required keyword arguments weren't added until 2.1, so if you have some arguments that you want to be required, that someone has to provide it, that wasn't added until 2.1, so we can't really take advantage of that feature. And here's some links that have given you more information. And these slides are on GitHub, so I'll be sharing them. So you don't have to take too many notes on this. This feature is actually really pretty, uh, really cool considering the alternatives. Uh, module prepend. Um, very often we'll have methods that are really slow or we just want to get more information about. And we don't want to hack the existing method. So in this case, we want to just print before we run the method. Maybe we started at this time and then maybe at the end of the method we want to see when it finished, right? Just bookend it. So in this case, we'll just try to get before the, the original methods call. So. so you can try doing, doing it in other ways, using alias method. So here we have a class that with the method run. And class parent, sorry, with a method run and a subclass run. And we're trying to inject this debug it before the subclass call. And you see it's pretty messy. Because you have, to, you have to actually basically rename the original method, call it, and then um, yeah, and then you can bookend it on the other side. So you can see when it actually runs, debug is the first thing, which is what we wanted. We wanted to be able to get our debugging module or method before the, the prior call. But the problem with this is pretty, it's pretty dirty. You have to modify the actual class to do this. And this is what alias method chain was doing previously. And I think it's been totally deleted from Rails. No? Okay, cool. A lot of, they, they've moved away from using it. Yeah, we don't use it. We never use it. Okay. Okay, so next, so that, that solves the problem, but it is pretty messy. So another way to, Try this with include, trying to include a module here with the method run into the subclass here and see what happens. So again, sub is the class with the slow run method. When we look at the ancestry, we see sub comes before debug it. And so when we run it, unfortunately, the original slow method is run before our debug it module method. So that doesn't solve the problem. So with prepend, you can see all, all that's changed is include becomes prepend. It does what we want. It puts our debug it module before our class. Joe, so it's either prepend or the old way. Is there a way to tell it where in that ancestor you want it specifically? I don't think so. I think you would have to. I mean, you could index it and say, make it the third thing and go into something. Well, you, you would have Does to do it. Sense? You would have to do it on the class that you want to right. get it get it in front of. Right. 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 In this case, sub has the method that's really slow, so we want to prepend that and have R one method default first, so that we could say, you know, we started at this time, run the original method, and then you could probably put it at the end. You could say, this is what how long it took. So you can see when you actually run it, we make what we want. We get debug it first, sub is second, and then the original parent class. So if you wanted to, in our module, we could add another line to print, you know, finished. And we can get timings, or you could use this for caching, anything you want, where you want to get in front of the method. And it's much cleaner than the alternative, which was the alias method. And it's important that you always call super. Otherwise, it's not going to run. The super class. The next feature in Ruby 2.0 um, is the array of symbols. Kind of a, sm a small feature, but pretty useful. And the percent capital I allows you to do interpolation. So you can see here, we just have a prefix, and we're just creating an array of symbols with that prefix. The next one is uh, refinements. This is kind of 
thorn in my side. I don't really uh, understand the benefit of it, but the idea is to localize some of your modifications. So if you modify the class, the uh, string, the string class, if you add some behavior to some method in, in, in that class, you don't want it to modify string for other applications or something like that that include your gem or your, your library. So it has some benefits, but I'm, I think there's many gotchas, especially with Ruby 2.0. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, um, it's not fully supported. I think it was experimental. Experimental. Yeah, it's experimental in 2.0. Uh, Ruby 2.1, it's no longer experimental, but it still has some shortcomings when, when you can use it. And honestly, I don't know how you would develop uh, using the files. There's a good explanation by Charles Nutter about some of the issues he had with implementing it on JRuby. And it was probably, I think it was one of the main reasons why it was uh, slowed down in its development because it was very difficult to implement and had many issues with it. The next feature is lazy, unenumerable. Normally when you have enumerable methods, they get evaluated left to right. With lazy you can uh, evaluate, it can peak and cheat and uh, evaluate from right to left. So it can, the, uh, Ruby can cheat, it can skip creating intermediate objects, and also uh, take, go over large collections and optimize it. So it doesn't have to go through the whole collection. So as an example, this is with, uh, what is this thing doing? It's taking the first five odd numbers. If the only difference is we're calling lazy. So if we just benchmark it, we can see we get a little bit uh, three or four times faster operations with lazy, uh, mainly because it doesn't have to go through the whole range of zero to 1,000 to get the first five odd numbers. So if you have really expensive operations that uh, take advantage of this, it would be useful to try. Did you memory profile that? No, I didn't. I think that's where you would actually show it. Because you created an object for every single one of those thousand, and then went through every single one of them. The second right. one only created like five objects. Right, so yeah, I'm not sure all of the cases where you can avoid creating intermediate objects, um, but it, when it can cheat, it will. And so there's a really great explanation in uh, Pat Chauncey's blog. So this is one of my favorites. Uh, nice. oh. This is this is the path of the. You uh, laughing? It's the path of the script without the file name. So you're currently executing the script. You wouldn't think it's that big a deal. Uh, so we in our script we just want to print it and it gives us the directory of where the script is. No files ever found. So I did a quick grab and we have almost a thousand alternatives, which is filed during a comes to a file. So this could be easily replaced with there. Okay, so now we're going to get into some breaking changes that we've run into. Um, it's important to note that we're still green on Travis, and we only actually have one failure in Ruby 2.1. So we're getting there. So this is one of the first ones I ran into, was um, objects don't respond to the protected methods. As you can see here in Ruby 193, public and uh, protected methods are included when you just call respond to if you don't pass any other options besides the method you're looking for. In 2.0, it only looks at public methods. The interesting thing is you can see though that 193 and 2.0 have the same interface uh, for this, these two examples, where you can pass true and you can tell Ruby to look at all methods. So, as an example, we have a class with a worker with a protected run method. And we, and we can see if we ask the new worker if he responds to run, and when I agree it's true, when I 2.0 it's false. But if we pass true as a second argument, they're both true. Why is this a problem? Like, where is this rear its head? Um, so we have, that's a good question, uh, pull request 685, the default bat value for gem is setting some default values in Rails. And so it has to do all sorts of things with checking to see if methods are defined and stuff and the response to it. 
And in that case, they were looking at protective methods and rails. The place we ran, so we ran into this bog in rails to, well, not bog, change. And the, where, where it was happening was like, so you have a super class, and for some reason, it seemed like a bad reason, but for some reason it would check, respond to, and it was expecting the subclasses to have, it was trying to check to see if the subclasses had an implementation of the method, and those subclasses would, it would be protected, right? And then it would fail, so, okay, just, I don't know why, I don't know why they were protected and not just private and then just do true. Actually, I don't understand the point of using yeah, well, that's the, that's the other thing is that you could solve this by, you know, either having, making your public interface well-defined and not actually expecting those methods, or just not using protected or private. Well, the private will be false, I assume. Yeah, private will be false. Yeah. The next one is one I'm still working on, is the uh, default character encoding of RubyScript specifically is UTF-8 now. Where this hurts us is where we're in the scanning code. A lot of the places we are, we have embedded like magic comments and all sorts of header information. We're expecting byte sequences. Uh, and in those cases, we have to try to uh, work around this. So in, in 193, it was US ASCII in, in the Ruby file. So when you have a binary string literal here, foo, you require it. The encoding is asking 8 bit. In 2.0, the default encoding is UTF 8. So we do the exact same operation as UTF 8. It actually comes in as an invalid encoding. And that's what's on the surface looks like the first problem we're going to run into if we don't make the changes. Not sure about the other ones. So. As I mentioned, we already use it in VM policing. The one that bites us the most is that when you have invalid UTF-8 encoded strings with Ruby 2.0, where we have a binary string literal and a script, and we don't specify that it's binary, if we all compare that to a string that we got from reading off the virtual disk or something like that, they won't be equivalent. So if we're trying to split based upon this value, we're trying to do anything with that binary string literal. If it's in this case, you'll have this issue. So you can see here, foo was not invalid, was not a valid encoding. And it was here we're forcing ASCII eight bit and they're not equivalent. So some solu solutions for this are you, you can force the binary on each individual string. This is compatible on 193 and 20. But unfortunately, it's really painful if you have many binary string literals. And you might have a file that you expect binary string literals all over the place, where you might have ma many different headers you're expecting, various spikes uh, sequences. So you can do that with the enforcing coding. Here, asking 8 bit. Right, and you can see here now everything is true. It matches, it's a valid encoding. It's basically the way it was before. Another option is there's a new B method on a string in Ruby 2.0, so it's not compatible on 193. This, uh, Let's see, the force encoding that I mentioned previously actually modifies the original uh, string. So you have to be careful if you're getting strings that are being passed around. If the uh, caller is not expecting you to modify their string. On, the other, on this side, we don't want to create strings if we don't have to. And the B method copies the string as an ASCII bit. So that's one thing that's kind of could be a problem if we uh, don't account for it. Are we, we're only having problems with string literals though, right? So far, yeah. Okay, so using B would be okay. Or, I'm sorry, using force encoding would be okay in those Yes, cases. yes. Right. It's only if you're passing that around and you're not expecting <coughs> to change. Okay, another solution is we can just say this entire file has the encoding that I want. We can basically put it back to what it was in 193. 
So this is compatible with 193 and 200. And it's a good option where we have a lot of our file system and various scanning code that's expecting lots of uh, binary string literals in our, in our code. And so you just do that by putting the pound encoding at the top of the file. If we define your constant, and then everything works just as you would expect. If, if, do we pass this constant through through other classes that are defined in other files? It's not generally, but I, you know, we have many of them. We still have a few hundred to go through. Because I remember, like, it's not only the file that's defining it, but if you pass it into a class that defines another file that's running over there, right? Uh, it, it, the yes. So you might interpret that file's encoding, not the file where you create the string? Yeah. No, that won't happen. No. If you have the, no, if you have the magic the commons, if you have the magic comment at the top, it's fine. Even if you're passing it to a class defined in another no, file that doesn't it. have that magic code. Yeah, yeah. Wherever it got required, it looks at the, it looks at the encoding declared in that file and everything in there is. The thing yeah. you might run into is like if you have another file where you declare a regex and you don't have the US ASCII and then you so the regex is UTF-8, and then you try to compare yeah, that against the binary string. So if those two files are disparate, you'll have a problem, right. because the regex needs to know that it's binary, if it's testing against that binary string. OK, what do you say? <laughs> the other things that I, I haven't really looked at, but uh, maybe Aaron would know, is that I, I'm not sure what would happen if we don't go through and convert all of the binary string literals. Because I can envision a situation where you have a UTF-8, say, null character, that then you want to try to append to or do something with other binary strings. I'm not sure what would happen with mix encodings. So mix encodings will, it, it really depends. I actually don't like this. You can do, if you do binary, no, 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 what is it? So if it's US ASCII and binary, and you try to concat those two, so say you have two strings, one's US ASCII, one's binary, and you concat those, it'll try to cast the binary one to US ASCII. And if that works, then it concatenates the two. But if you have UTF-8 and a binary, and you try to concat those two, it'll raise an exception, which I think is the, that is the most desired behavior. Right. Okay, so, so I hear you saying we should make all of them US ASCII. We should make, well, we should make all the binary, right. we should do everywhere where we're declaring those binary strings, we should just make them US ASCII. Just, right, just do it. Just do it, yeah. Okay, so the next issue we ran into was with uh, Jerry and Mo. Uh, we had an issue where um, Ruby 2.0 will close file descriptors that you have open when you spawn a new process and only leave open standard out, standard error, standard in. So this was to prevent file uh, descriptor leakage. And there's a reference bug here and a pull request an issue that we can reference. In the example we ran, it in, ran into it, we had a shared pipe. And we wanted to communicate um, for the BDK um, communication of the URI of the DRB server. So the two processes wanted to talk to each other. And unfortunately, the shared pipe has been closed on us. First one trial. So the sol solution was just to tell it not to close, close on exit. Does this only happen on spawn? Yes. Yeah. I think that it was a fix in kernel spawn or a ch change in kernel kernel spawn. It, I think it actually has something that says it might, just, might not leave only these file scripts open, but it stopped working. Because I do this all the time, but with four, like right? All the time. Right. I was using kernel spawn and something in, in one nine three for this, and it specifically has a value that says leave the file descriptors open, but it no longer works. Mm. I know with spawn it's an issue. I don't know about like if you backtick. Yeah, I don't know about other system. Other, like system or anything else. I know for I know for course. But you see, the thing is, because of the main fork, it, it compels it to adhere to the fork paradigm of the OS. Yeah, yeah. So it will be so that should less be, acceptable yeah. to do that. Whereas here, it's an abstraction away from that. So they have more leeway, which I think is very cool. Right, so if you, if you use uh, close my exact equals false, then it doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jerry wasn't too happy about that. I guess I don't <laughs> either, but. I thought that was fun to track down. 
Well, actually, thankfully, Mo found it. Yeah, Mo found it. Well, yeah. we just had to remember. You had to remember that. I had to go back when Mo came. Yeah, to remember what? Why was I doing this? Oh yeah. yeah you came back from vacation. Right. So the next thing is uh, string lines. Uh, now returns an array, whereas previously it gave you uh, enumerators. And similar, similarly with uh, chars, bytes, and code points. And also, we had a case with string I.O. where we were doing lines, and that's actually deprecated as opposed to being changed. Maybe to us. So string I.O., I.O., and friends, each one of their methods also, uh, instead of being changed to an array, they're just deprecated. So we actually had to change it to just do each line. That's a focus on 14. Okay, so are we there yet? I guess that's the real problem. Uh, with the example I gave with Ruby 187 and 193, it's uh, over a year, so hopefully we're not going to take that long. So uh, before I even started on Ruby 2.0, some of the things that I've learned through upgrading from 186 to 187 and 193 and with Rails, various Rails upgrades is that when we have old code that no one knows what it's doing, it's just grounds for being deleted because if we don't need it, we just got to get rid of it because it gets in the way so many times. So this is a great quote that I, or actually a commit message I found in, uh, after Heartbleed, the uh, free uh, OpenBSD developers started forking OpenSSL and they just saw that there was lots of features in OpenSSL that no one uses and have all sorts of back doors. So the key point, the key takeaway of it is this guy's been working on this for over 11 years, uh, which is one year less than the age of this header file. And that in this time, the only thing he's learned is that code doesn't delete itself. So if it's not, if it's not being used, we just gotta get rid of it. And Git is our friend because we can always get it back if we need it. So with that as the intro to Ruby 2.0, the path of 2.0, this is just, just me, but um, not all of these commits are Ruby 2.0, but generally most of them. So basically just getting rid of all of the excess. We still had 187 to 193 backward compatibility stuff. We're going to get rid of that. Anything else that can just get in the way. We still had code that had 187 syntax for case statements. Uh, that just has to just go away. If we're not using it, just get rid of it. So I call that a reset. So there's more opportunities. We already talked about the host directory, possibly being replaced with the uh, WinRM gen. The SOAP for our action web service is used for our SOAP uh, web services, and that's just, that was a pain to get to 193 in our fork that took many, many weeks and just needs to go. Additionally, uh, hand soap, while it's useful and we use it for a lot of our uh, communication with uh, VMware, it's a fork and we have to get up to upstream's version of hand soap, so we're not maintaining it. Additionally, we have root port, Zaya, which also patches Rails, makes changes to it, so every time we upgrade Rails, we have to say, is this method also being changed by Zion? We still support prototype and jQuery, but we gotta just go to uh, jQuery. We have old Rails plugins. Some gems haven't been updated in a long time, so they've got various issues. And we have old monkey patches. All of this doesn't need to be done for 2.0. Right now we're green, and you'll see it on the slide later on. I already have an appliance running Ruby 2.0 and have basic functionality working. But these still need to go. If we don't do it now, it's just going to stay here until we try to do 2 1. Additionally, another roadblock is that we, our tests take 30 minutes on a good day. Um, so we have to separate our tests, get rid of some of the excess database setup. Any place where we're doing like creating hundreds of rows, when one or two would be able to test the function we want, we're going to do that. We can remove old tests that are kind of useless now. We could use the allocation tracing in Ruby 2.1 to give us, give us more information as to which tests are really slow and why. And then we can drop support for 193 once we're on to a stable. 
So I already talked about the appliances. I had a CentOS appliance where I manually installed Ruby 2 out. Was able to do basic uh, testing of the appliance. Was able to do scanning using uh, VDDK. Was able to get some basic inventory from vCenter and basic recording. So we're, get, we're getting close. The next goal would be to automate building appliances with Ruby 2 out in the community edition. So currently we use uh, Ruby 193 built for the software collections, RPMs. Unfortunately, those are not multi-platform. So there are changes that could be in the RPM that us as developers aren't seeing. It also causes some of those, uh, some of those patched gems to force restrictions on us. We had that with the bundle. And Ruby 2.1, which is where we want to go to, is not even packaged in the software collection of RPMs yet. It's, I think it's due for uh, probably for March of next year. So I don't anticipate Ruby 2.1 being available anytime soon as RPM. So what I'm suggesting is we use RPMs for the base CentOS operating system and the libraries for we need to build Ruby compile the gems. Wait, so RPMs for the base set to us? Yeah. Instead of gems? To build the operating system, let send to us base RPMs install the various things. Oh, okay. Base Not system. our stuff, but just the OS. Yes, just build the OS with RPMs, build the li li libraries we need to build Ruby, and compile the gems. Then we'll use something like Ruby install or Ruby build for, uh, to build the actual Ruby. And we let Bundler do it as well. So this is to go away from the SCL? Or for the community, yeah. Okay. That's the only way we can get to 2.0. But at least 2.0, I mean, in the time frame that we want to go to 2.0, we can't get 2.0. Right. I anticipate we should probably keep Travis supporting the latest Ruby and then maybe one back for stability. And we try not to break compatibility until we run into a situation where we have to. So on a developer side, getting set up is not really any different than 193. You use whatever you use, RBM, or Ruby install, Ruby build. Uh, people manage it with RBM, RBMB, Ruby, whatever. So we need uh, to people to try it and document any issues. So I'll start taking notes on what I ran into. Um, and then other tools, if people are using RubyMine, I'm not sure how to configure that with Ruby 2.0, so we'll need someone to try that. And Simple. Yeah. yeah okay. Thank you. Um, we might have similar issues with the buggers on Ruby 2.0. You know, I just haven't talked about it. So we'll just have to document that as we see. <coughs> so I, here I just have some links. I have the slides up on my, my GitHub account. It's actually, uh, that's it. So, any questions? So, 2.1 is available now. 2.1.3 is available. So, and we're going to 2.0 initially, and then we're going to go to 2.1? Yes. And is the reason we're not going directly to 2.1 the RPM issue you mentioned? So, I think on um, upstream, we can go to 2.0. As soon as that's stable, we can go right to 2.1.3 or whatever is available at that time. Uh, I think the thing that we got to remember is that going from 187 to 193, even though those numbers are very close, that was huge. Mm. Even going from 187 to 192, or whatever, was huge. Going from uh, 20 to 21, was, I, so far we have one failing test. Safe level four is the only thing we've run into for the delivery. So I doubt that's going to be difficult to get to. And if we're, if we're using Bundler and everything for everything else, it should be just simple to support both 2.0 and 2.0. Any questions? Were there any additional uh, threading changes in 2.0? Um, threading? No. no, I don't think so. It's a minor release. It's Compared to what we've been working with, we've so we really implemented true multi threading in 1.9, but there were some restrictions on it initially, is that right? Oh, 
no more. I mean, the restrictions are the restrictions are basically like the threads are native OS threads. It's just that you can only schedule one thread at a time, which is what the GBL does, and that's the same. I mean, nothing's changed with regard to that. Okay. So basically, the OS handles scheduling. What about downstream Joe? Say again. What about downstream and doing all the gems so we can do a downstream build? The whole RPM is. Right. So. That's why I think if we have upstream monitoring Travis, looking at Travis, and you can, we can have our, our various integration servers test different versions of Ruby, 2.0 and 2.1 are so close that we should be able to maintain compatibility across the board. And then we just have to keep our eye on gems to make sure they're compatible. Yeah, but don't, what, what's the state of all the 193 gems that we carry now? Are we, we're going to have to build them all for 2.0 and then 2.1? Depending on when we release it. It's close. Yeah, I know. It's, the that's, bridge is in sight. That's a discussion we have to have. Yeah. So what are the bridge? Yeah, do we have plans? Like the water's like, flowing over that bridge. Yeah. Do you have plans for continuing to upgrade? Like, you know, after, I mean, we, I don't know if we want to go right when 2.2 is released, but, you know, like, we want to just kind of, I mean, we want to keep on top of it this time, right? But, yeah. I mean, you know, like, do we wait three months and then, Okay, let's check it out and make sure it's stable and upgrade, or is it just like, you know? I think it depends. If 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 we were at 2.0 right now and we were looking at 2.1, there, you know, other than like one or two things, there's not anything that breaks us. So it's just, just it's just it. like all benefits. Like, right. You have the same exact code and it's like almost a third faster. Yeah. Uh, you know, unless you write code that's fully optimized for memory and allocating objects, 2.1 will be faster. Too uh, so it depends on what features are. You know, once they do three or whatever the next major one is, right. I think we can be more cautious. But minor releases like this, <coughs> just, just go for it. Oh you, you mentioned the point about having to wait for the software collections. To, to, is that to, just to build the appliance? So yeah. So on um, the uh, community edition, the SendOS appliance, we were building off of the public. RPMs in the software collections. And so they had Ruby and some small set of gems packaged as RPMs. And we were, build, we, were building, we were building appliances. That's what their current appliance is. It's using RPMs for those. Um, there are just too many issues with doing that. Mainly, we've run into problems where there were patches on the RPM side that didn't match what we were running on our laptops. And so you just run into compatibility issues. So I think it's probably worthwhile to have the same environment on our up upstream appliance. And then we can worry about downstream packaging elsewhere. We can have other ways to monitor that. We, with continuous integration, we can install those same RPMs on integration servers and let them handle whatever issues. Thank you.